the Milankovic cycles are actually quite famous in climate science. You know, anybody taking an introductory course learns about them because there are cycles that are thousands to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years long. And basically they affect the amount of solar radiation that hits the surface of the earth and the latitude at which it hits the surface of the earth and therefore they affect climate. Emergency Forum. My name is Regina and I'm your host as we discuss Milankovitch cycles and climate variations. So this has been kind of a, a hot topic lately. Uh, we're not riding the trend. This is a show that we planned for a while, but you know what? It's great when people are having the conversation around the same topics because then we can take a deep dive. And I'm glad that you decided to click on our channel to find out what we have to say about the Milankovitch cycles. By the way, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. And on with the discussion. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of Mr. Milankovitch. Mr. Milankovitch, he was a Serbian geophysicist and astronomer. He had a very interesting life and it's amazing to me when I am able to learn about these scientists from so long ago and they didn't have smartphones, they didn't have the Apple computer, and they were able to discover so much about our Earth and our planet and how it moves and what that movement means for us who call the Earth home. It's really uh, quite astounding and inspiring. But one of the things that I thought was so interesting, and I've had these conversations, and, and maybe you have too, or maybe you've heard people say things such as, Earth's climate's always been changing. Always has. Well, that's true. You know, this is what our Dr. Milankovitch found out, that there is a natural climate change. However, I want to put a big caveat here that this natural climate change of which we're speaking tonight, comes over the course of around 100,000 years. So it's not something that we would see in our lifetime. And when we do see the major changes that we have seen in our lifetimes, those of us who've lived long enough know in New York City, it's almost the end of January. It hasn't snowed yet. I remember 20, 25 years ago, this was not the case. Okay, so that's a rapid and major change in our lifetime. And that's not the type of change that Milankovitch was talking about. Another thing that I want to bring about when we speak of Milankovitch is we're in this beautiful period right now. We're not in an ice age. And I got to tell you, as someone who hates the cold, I'm really grateful for that. We're in a warm period. It's nice. It allows us to thrive and prosper. Unfortunately, we're making it warm, too warm, too fast. On to Milankovitch. What is this Milankovitch? What did he find? What did he talk about? And he spoke about three specific movement types. One of them was eccentricity. And this was a descriptor of how the earth travels from an elliptical movement, from a circular movement to an elliptical movement. Another movement that he spoke of was tilt. And then another one was precession. So what does this have to do with anything? What does this mean? It's about how the planet moves. And I want to, when you're thinking about eccentricity, again, the earth, you can think of it as moving around in a circle. And at a certain point, that cir circle becomes more oval, but it's not so drastic as an oval. It's just less circular. And then the tilt and when I think of the earth moving in a tilt, I like to think of the tilt a whirl, you know, like you've been to Coney Island or some other type of amusement park. If you've ever been in that ride and it, it spins and it spins and then it tilts like this, this is kind of an example of, of how the earth can tilt. 
And what do these movements mean in terms of making us closer to an ice age or further away towards a warming trend? I'm going to hand it off to Paul and have him add on to just this base layer that I put down there for discussion. Thank you, Regina. So yes, the Milinkovic cycles are actually quite famous in climate science. You know, anybody taking an introductory course learns about them because there are cycles that are thousands to hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years long. And basically they affect the amount of solar radiation that hits the surface of the earth and the latitude at which it hits the surface of the earth. And therefore they affect climate. Now, if somebody tells you that we're in a warming period because of Milankovic cycles, you can completely ignore and discount that because these are cycles that affect us over long periods of time and certainly don't have any effect on a year to year human experience sort of scale. So there's three main cycles that Milankovic came up with. And he did this work in the 20s, 1920s. He was born in 1879, died in 1958. So he was still sort of midway through his career. And he did a couple major things. One of them was calculating how much sunlight was hitting the different planets and how it would affect temperatures. And also these cycles, these, you know, what causes the Earth seasons, what causes uh, long-term cycles, because there was some work being done, preliminary work sort of on ice cores and on sediment cores in the ocean floor that showed that we had periods of warming and periods of cooling. We had ice ages and, and warm periods. So the main cycle, or the first of the three, is the eccentricity of the Earth. And as you said, it varies from a circle. If this E value is zero, you have a complete circle. And if the E value as it increases, you get more elliptical or football shaped or oval orbit. Um, and the earth right now is mildly elliptical and it cycles from these different situations over a time scale nominally of 100,000 years. If you break that 100,000 year cycle down and look at the finer detail, there's a cycle that's 405,000 years. There's one that's 95,000 years and there's one that's 124,000 years. But if you mesh them together, you get basically a 100,000 year cycle. And this is a type of cycle that's dominated changes in the earth over a period of say, of say the last million years. We've had these 100,000 roughly year cycles where we go from a warm period or interglacial to a glacial period and, and back again. Another key factor that has a cycle is the axial tilt, also called the obliquity. It's how tilted the earth is on its axes. The more tilt there is, the more extreme the seasons are. So if the tilt is very large, summers are very, very warm, winters are very, very cold. And the less, if there was no tilt at all, we wouldn't have seasons. That tilt varies from about 22.1 degrees to 24 and a half degrees. Right now it's about 23 and a half and decreasing. So it's very important for seasons. And then precession, the tilt of the earth, the earth is rotating about that, the, about the axes that's, that, that's tilted, but it's like a gyroscope or a top. You know, when a top that you're spinning on a table slows down, it starts to sway around and the axes of rotation move. And that's exactly what happens with the earth. Right now, if you look in the north, the North Star kind of polar, Polaris is where the North Star is pointing. So the obliquity or axial tilt cycle is about 41,000 years. Now the precession cycle where the axes of rotation processes around like a top, that is nominally about 21,000 years, but some people say 25,000, 26,000 years. There's a little bit of confusion because the elliptical orbit also processes slightly. And then, then when you add all those factors in, nominally you see more like something like 25 to 26,000 years. But anyway, these are very long time scales. And the actual radiation at any point on the surface, you need to determine by taking the sine waves of these three cycles and superimposing them all together. And you can imagine that sometimes the three peaks are gonna coincide 
At other times, the three crests, the three troughs are going to coincide. So you get a variation of effects. So some ice ages are a lot deeper and last a lot longer than other ice ages. Same with warm periods. So these cycles affect the climate significantly, but on a very, very long thousands to hundreds of thousands of year time scale. Thank you so much for that, Paul. You covered a lot of ground, you know, really added to what's beginning to be a little bit more knowledge of a Milankovitch. And Peter, I'm interested what you have to share. Well, I've been I've been listening closely to both of you. I, I think I'm just beginning to understand uh, what M Mr. Milankovic achieved, which is absolutely, truly amazing. Uh, I'd like to introduce what I think is perhaps the, uh, to me, the most amazing thing that uh, today's climate experts have achieved, and, and that's the ice cores. I am really, really in awe of their work. And um, they're still doing it. Um, they're still refining um, uh, the results that they got from the ice cores. I guess I guess Richard Alley was one of the leading names in, in that aspect of the science. So the ice cores go back 800,000 years now. In the uh, fourth assessment of the IPCC, they went back 650,000 years. And at that time, the IPC said that the increase of uh, greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, uh, they had some nitrous oxide in at that time. They called the increase unprecedented. And that, I think, was very, very important because we are in the middle of an unprecedented situation with regards to the amount of heat forcing that we're applying to the climate system. And when you look at those numbers, it truly, truly is insane. And what is even more insane is that our leaders aren't stepping back from that at all. They're piling more uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So there's a lot that I think we can learn from those ice cores. So there's a cold periods and warm periods. I remember Professor James Lovelock saying years ago that the planet seemed to like it cold best. The uh, warming, or I should say the cooling, comes down very slowly on the ice core record. So they last a long time. Very interestingly, the heating is always very fast. So when you look at 800,000 year ice core, it looks like it's, a, it's an abrupt uptick in the temperature. And of course, you know, it's well known that the temperature increase and decrease is almost in lockstep with the um, atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. So, I mean, that's obviously very, very crucial. Of course, the deniers have tried to uh, confuse people with the ice cores, as indeed they have, and I think they still are, as Paul has referred to, trying to confuse us with the Milanchevic cycle, right? But the ice cores prove definitively that the increase in temperature is due to the increase in atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. There's rather a, a sort of worrying kind of model, if you, if you want there. The atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, it varies by about 150 parts per million, which seems to be not very much. The uh, methane concentration in the complete sort of shoot up to its maximum is about 400 parts per million. And the temperatures vary by about five degrees C. So I've always thought that is pretty, pretty damn worrying because um, of the rate, as I say, at which we're putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Right now, we're at, and the limit is the other thing that always, I've always considered very, very important. So over this 800,000 year period, Atmospheric CO2 has never gone above 300 parts per million. Atmospheric methane has never gone above 800. And there's a similar number for nitrous oxide. We, the, we've got better ice cores for nitrous oxide now. And we can see that nitrous oxide um, goes up and down practically in, in lockstep with the temperature changes. So our atmospheric uh, CO2 concentration now, NOAA has confirmed the uh, NASA posting that we are now at the incredible, insane, giddy level of 420 parts per million. And it's never gone higher than 300 parts per million in 800,000 years. It's actually never gone higher in the past one and a half million years because there is an experimental ice core 
a European ice core that goes back that far. And they find that the ranges are, are exactly the same. Methane, which is now at 1,925 parts per billion, when you look at the ice cores, never gone above 800 parts per billion. So CO2, in other words, has now increased, well, from pre-industrial, it's, it's increased now over 50%. We are in the catastrophically dangerous situation. You could just get this from the ice core, the definite numbers, the scientists have nailed them down. It's terrifying, literally terrifying to me when I look at the messages from ancient ice. I really like, I like how you, you know, some people read tea leaves and uh, thank you, Peter, for reading the ice cores for us. Yeah, it's, it's really startling. And when I was looking at the Milankovitch cycles, it did strike me that the cycles tracked with the warming and cooling of the temperature, just as the CO2 cycles, winter and summer track with the heating and cooling. And we see this patterning. It, I, I find it to be really quite interesting. And I would be loath to leave this discussion without some mention of the man. You know, one thing that is astonishing to me, again, I mentioned that this was you know, he was born around 100 years ago, and he was able to come up with all of these findings without the various accoutrements that we have today. He had a really tough life. He uh, was homeschooled. I guess nothing so unusual about that. His father died when he was eight. Three of his brothers died of tuberculosis. And yet he went on to study and enlighten us. There were other scientists before him who tried to prove that the climate was in the stars, if you will, or with the movement of the planet, and they were never able to, and they were completely debunked, and the whole idea was debunked, but he was like, I am going to continue on, and I am going to prove that this is right. And one of the things that Milankovitch has given to me is this notion that we really, really need thinkers today. We need people who uh, aren't afraid to continue onward with previous scientists' legacy of science and coming up with ideas about what is happening with the planet and what that is telling us. So I just thought that that was really important to mention before I pass it back to Paul. Thank you, Regina and, and Peter as well. Yeah, if you think of Serbia, quite small country, small population, you know, Milenkovic is, is one of their most famous people, but he's in the shadow of Tesla, of course, because uh, Nikola Tesla is, is probably the most famous, you know, his work has had more influence on humanity, you know, electrical grids, et cetera, all of the work that he did. And... It's interesting, you know, we lost a lot of his work in a big fire and he had to go and restart and redo everything. And so Tesla had quite a bit of adversity to his work and, you know, look what he's accomplished. So yes, the, the ice cores, we of course don't know directly what the temperature was before we had thermometers. You know, we have indirect methods that we call proxies. Think of tree rings for going back to find out uh, based on the width of the tree ring, we can get an idea as to how much rainfall there was and how healthy the tree was and sort of mean temperatures for measuring isotopes and things within the tree, within the wood. Going back further, of course, the, the ice cores, as Peter mentioned, we have a record of the climate going back. In Antarctica, the ice is the thickest. So the record, the Antarctic ice core record goes back uh, 800,000 plus years. And in fact, they're working on new cores and they're hoping to bring that to a million years. Greenland, the ice is not as thick, so the record there doesn't go back as far, but it goes back several hundred thousand years. You know, anyway, don't know what the, then again, they're working on, on drilling in some of the thicker regions to bring it back even further, you know, to 400, 500,000 years. And if you look at um, glaciers on, in, in Alpine regions, like the Andes and stuff, uh, you know, you can get records going back, uh, yeah, 100,000 years, at least on those, but they're not as thick again as, as uh, 
Arctic uh, as Greenland glaciers or Antarctica glaciers. And then if you want to go back further, uh, we need to look at marine core sediments in the ocean floor where you drill down and you pull out a whole slug of marine sediment and then do the dating and things on that. And with all of these different proxies, you match them up, of course. You know, you don't look at ice cores exclusively. You look at the, you know, how they, how they align and how they match up to tree rings in the shorter term and to uh, sediments in, in longer term. And if there's volcanic eruptions, you get a layer of iridium and you can match that in each of the records. So we have a pretty good uh, record of how the climate has changed in the past. These are paleo records, if you like, and they clearly show that these cycles of, you know, ice age to interglacial to ice, ice age have occurred, you know, numerous times in the past. And you know, it is quite amazing that uh, Milankovic was able to associate this with the orbital variations in the Earth around the Sun and actually to come up with dates of cycles and do all the work that he did. It's, it's actually quite, quite amazing. And of course, it has this, a, a major effect on long term climate change and cycles. Thank you for that wrap up, Paul. And I'm going to pass it right back to Peter. Yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm very glad that Paul mentioned the ocean sediment because, really, I guess I should have said that the uh, most amazing of the science that goes back in time is the research that has been ongoing, uh, similar to the ice cores on the ocean sediment. Now, the uh, the ocean sediments can take us back something like forty million years or so, which is truly, truly, truly astounding. Scientists on the rate of increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration find that in actual fact, we're pushing up CO2 at a rate that is unprecedented, unprecedented in tens of millions of years, that is. Um, that was first published, to my knowledge, in 2016 by the World Meteorological Organization. And there's been a recent paper which has found the same thing, that we are pushing up CO2 and CO2 is the main heating agent and the only acid ocean acidification agent. We are pushing that up faster than it's naturally been pushed for the past many tens of millions of years. So we need to show a little bit more respect for our scientists who have done this amazing work and um, act responsibly and accordingly. Thank you so much, Peter. This has been a really interesting forum for me tonight. I learned a lot. You know, I, I knew a little bit of the science of Milankovic. I think one of the things that I found most interesting for me was the adversity that he faced and, and just how he persevered, you know? And I think that is a huge lesson that we can all take, especially those of us who want to be informed about the climate, what's happening in our changing climate, why it's happening, how it's happening. Knowing all of this can be very difficult. And the way I see it, if uh, Nikola Tesla, wow, what an amazing life, as Paul mentioned, and Milankovic, these people did what they had to do to, to bring light to this world. And I'm certainly would not even compare myself or put myself in that league, but all to say that those of us who are on this climate journey, if you will, we can look to them as our inspiration and our, our way to stay strong because we see that it's been done before. And I hope that you got as much out of this as I did. If you did, please consider subscribing. We would love to have you back. We have many, many different topics and you can look through our videos and please consider sharing uh, this video with a friend of yours. And we look forward to seeing you again at the next Climate Emergency Forum. <laughs>